Hey everyone, my name's Sean and welcome to Geeks Varna. Since the start of the year, the new UK drone rules have brought about some exciting prospects. This includes being able to fly within 50 metres of uninvolved people in a built-up area with your legacy sub 2 kilogram drone if you gain an A2 C of C qualification. However, many of our viewers have contacted us to express some confusion over how to interpret the flights over vehicles, vessels and structures part of the UK CAA CAP 722. Today, we're going to clear up that confusion and give you some guidance. So we're going to be talking about the A2 CMC and in particular the CAP 722 um, um, Chapter 2 where they talk about vehicles, vessels and structures because of course we've, we've lost the the, the the separation distance from from those from those types of things and it comes down to separation from people now um but we are looking at um, a lot of confusion out there because a, a, a2 cfc holders are contacting geeks Barna often at the moment and they're very concerned because of course there is the 50 meter horizontal separation with the legacy drones uh, they're very concerned about flying over buildings and that type of thing because the information they're receiving out there is that because you have to assume there might be people in those buildings which of course is a especially in lockdown is a fairly safe assumption um, they're assuming they can't fly over those buildings they're assuming that they can't fly pretty much anywhere apart from going up and coming back down so ev everyone is you know looking to sell their mavic air twos and and, and, and buy minis and, and mini twos so we're going to take a look at the the cap 722 chapter here uh, the regulations are focused on the safety of uninvolved persons and so there are no specific minimum distances set down for separation from vehicles vessels and structures however this does not imply that there are no limits to consider at all in many cases vehicles vessels and structures will still have persons inside them who need to be protected uh, there are two important parts to consider First of all, the current endangerment regulation in the Air Navigation Order Article 241 still applies, and so it is an offence to endanger such property with an unmanned aircraft, which, again, that makes sense, and that's something that, that isn't new to CAP 722, that's how we've always been flying our drones under. Um, the prescribed separation distances from uninvolved persons still apply to persons that are occupants of any vehicle, vessel or structure. Therefore, the relevant limitations for separating from persons must still be applied, unless the remote pilots can be certain that they are either unoccupied, so I suppose you could go knocking on the doors, but then, you know, <laughs> perhaps they just didn't answer, or, it moves on to the next page, in the case of structures, the remote pilot can be certain that the occupants will still be protected. Additionally, the overall security and privacy situation must be considered. Uh, there may be buildings in the area where it would be inadvisable from a security or privacy standpoint, standpoint uh, to be flying close to without first obtaining permission to do so. Which, again, that, that last paragraph makes complete sense. You know, you're not going to be flying over... I, I would suggest any kind of sensitive infrastructure, schools or police stations, or, you know, we, we, we can all think of the big long list of things that, that, of buildings that we shouldn't be flying over. What is your view? Reading that, as, as a professional drone pilot, the, the um, in, in, in fact, what, what, is, what is the title that, that, we've, that we've given you? Is it King of Drones? I, I couldn't possibly say, I mean, that's up to you to give me a title, I'm not going to be. <laughs> okay, so, uh... so as the King of Drones, <laughs> um, what, what, what is your view on this? Do you feel that um, A2 CFC holders need to essentially stay away from residential buildings completely, that they have to have that 50 metre uh... separation? Yeah, but I think just to give some context of why we sort of potentially know a little bit more about this is because we've been going into this with not just the CEA, but the police for quite some years now. So this sort of, from our perspective, all started back um, with outdoor music festivals, whereby yes. there are some festivals where we want to fly on the other side of a fence from people. And we now have a five meter takeoff distance we can use. Excellent. from for any of our aircraft however back when we were doing this it was still 30 and the question was we had a solid steel fence known as steel shield which is about th sort of it's i think it's three meters tall yes. and it's a solid you cannot get through it it cannot be penetrated that easily and basically the question was does that deem a suitable barrier because the law doesn't say you can have a barrier in between technically or the old law didn't it just said 30 meters but if the drone can't fly the full 30 meters because there's a physical object, 
we had it then confirmed with the CA and also some um, police who were working with the CA on that one festival we were talking about um, agreed that the solid barrier up to the height of that barrier mm-hmm. would be considered protection for the public. Okay. Obviously, then once you got above it, you had to then comply with the rules and things. Yes. And that's essentially why we went down the route to get a five meter OSC. Okay. Uh, for, for that specific part of the OSC anyway. So that's where we started off going into it. Then about after that, that was still at the point where the CEA deemed inside as regulatory area. So I was safety officer for Drone Racing League. Um, and we did a show around the world. Um, it, was great, it was great to get to tour and watch drones flying. It was great. Indeed. And get paid for it as well. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, we, uh, we, we did a show in Alexander Palace in London. And I knew Alexander Palace as a, as a building in a safety terms. I know the head of safety there quite well. And they're a client of ours now. Um, so we had to look into a lot of detail about this is the first event DRL had ever put a crowd in the audience for. Awesome. And not just a, a crowd of people we like a public crowd yes so we had to work with the ca lot and back then it was jerry corbett who's run who is now policy lead for drones but was sort of the lonely person for drones at points they hadn't created the, the unit as it is now and there we worked with them and we basically had to identify physical barrier measures to protect the public that meant the the public could technically get up to four millimeters away from a, our drones and that's because we use a thing called mojo barriers, which is at the front. They're at the front of concerts normally. Yes. And there's an acrylic top for riots they put on top, which is sort of, you know, that thick, uh, but four mil thick and plastic. And we did all the structural tests to prove a, a DRL drone at full speed could not penetrate that. And on top of that, we had a net and the net was overlapping. So if it went into the net, it would deflect in, but then would throw back out on, to- on the other side of the barrier. So we went through all these physical tests to prove that, that was safe containment. The CEA then accepted that that was acceptable to prevent incursion. Therefore, people could be four millimeters away from the drones and be quite up close. Um, it's a very similar process, like Formula One goes through for you yes. know, containment nets and all that Absolutely. sort of stuff. And it, it, it wasn't technically, the law said 30 meters at the time or you know, 50 meters in flight. It didn't say if you put mitigation in place. Um, so this is actually a step up that they're now saying if unless they're not, if, unless they are protected. Um, and then obviously the CEA, step back after that and said, no, we don't do indoors. Yes. Um, it's HSE regulation. So there wasn't really that, that there wasn't much happening that would force the issue. Now this revision has forced the issue in terms of without much issue, you know, it, it, it's proactive being forced as an issue rather than due to volume of work or anything, which is really good because it shows, as we've talked about before, they're putting stuff in now that just yes. makes sense or, yes, you know, or stuff absolutely. they know needs clarified. So it's really good in that respect. But yeah, then we so under this what it says now in terms of the separation i fully get the bit from people and you know who aren't protected or from vessels because you know it depends on the type of obviously vehicle and things but a soft top car is much more uh, yes. at risk for the <laughs> occupants than a hard risk car with no sunroof yes um and things like that in terms of structures i think the one reference point that everyone should be aware of probably is the most recent and relevant was the crash in los angeles which flew into a building now i'm not going to comment on the circumstances of that because i don't know i just know it went into a building and somebody put some pictures up of it but that clearly showed that it penetrated glass and wood in in the structure of that building absolutely and that's not surprising to me because if you had high enough velocity and things things will crack and, and smash so i think that's a really good example to show to give an idea of it of all drone users about the levels of protection a building offers yes or actually alexandra palace was if you've ever been there there's huge glass atriums we were Indeed. flying around yes and it was single pane as well as less than what that building had so our concern was if it smashes it's also listed building and protected so yes. in this case of if it smashes <laughs> that's a big cost and we had to protect people we actually didn't have any spectators in that area during the racing because of that risk they were held in the, the non-glass bits of the course um so it was you know, that's the consideration so when we're talking about buildings is if they're protected if a person is just behind glass or wood or something that sort of plastic you know light plastic things like that yes they're not really going to be protected yes, at all absolutely um you know, even most bus shelters are made of glass roofs and things. There's things like that aren't going to be protect people on the street. Um, whereas if it's a, a brick building, a concrete building, you know, anything solid, 
there is not a hope in hell of a drone going through that unless indeed. you make one specifically to do that purpose. Yes, yes, or kind of explosive payload, specially designed, or massive. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. The, the the key thing I would say is this is their new essentially. Yes, it's the regulations, but the text you've shown is essentially more policy than regulation. But yes, in terms of that, so this needs to be tested in a court. This has never been tested. No one's ever pleaded not guilty for these types of offences. Uh, the, the ones that have happened have pleaded guilty for the most part. Therefore, a trial doesn't have to happen in terms of yes, assessing indeed. what this actually means. I can't see any judge ever convicting any pilot for uh, endangering someone whereby there was a brick wall or a solid brick wall with no openings in it or concrete roof in between the drone and them it's just impossible i mean you've exactly. got the remote chance of a chain reaction where you know you're flying a drone over a building it crashes it goes on creates a fire in the building and all that yeah. consequential yeah, stuff indeed. that indeed. could be an endangerment offense as they talk about under 241 yes. because there's a causal chain but being directly impacted by the drone falling on, over a building that's not going to happen i'm not saying it means you can willy-nilly just fly your heart's content because you know you have there's skylights assessing. in buildings there's yes, different exactly. things there's balconies exactly. it's you, you have to assess this constantly yes you have to be but as a general rule times. if it's a solid roof with no way for that drone to penetrate there's no way you could get prosecuted for that because it's not reasonable exactly exactly which which which, which was my view on it um, and and i think as you say with this guidance um, where, where they where they where they talk about what the regulation is and then they move on to the points to consider. Um, I think that, that as you say, this is this is one of the areas where I feel the CAA have actually been very open about how they feel and therefore their policy on on this side of things yeah. is going to be. They they want you to make sure that the that the, the current in, that you're aware that the current endangerment regulation of the um, ANO uh, two four one still applies. So you you have to be careful from that point of view, um, and that covers every single flight, whether you're in you know the middle of a field or or, or the, i'll say the middle of london but i don't like saying that because we get lots of comments how do you fly in london um which which there is actually a video coming up on that everybody so um keep an eye out for that one the prescribed separation distances from um, uninvolved persons still apply so they they of course say which 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 is which again makes sense it, it is reasonable to presume that when you're flying towards a building like the building I'm, I'm in right now, someone's outside flying their drone, it is reasonable to assume that there, there could be people in that building and those people, of course, warrant protection. Uh, but the building I'm in is a very old house. Um, it does have fairly big windows, but um, you know it, it is it is a very solid old structure. Um, a, a, an, a, a drone being flown in, in the legacy class sub, sub, two, sub two kilogram at the moment is not going to, I hope, as you say, unless there's some freak dest final destination movie style um, uh, combination. Like that video, wasn't that the film The Drone or something? Yes, the that's it. Film? Yes, yes, that's it. So um, <laughs> unless we're in the scene from The Drone 2, um, that drone isn't hopefully going to cause me any harm so i i would personally fly over this building i think as well as it's we can look at where the ca sort of have come to get this from yes so where they talk about that it talks about the public being protected and a lot of what they say is about also as well but uninvolved but people being involved having the ability to move out of the way or anything yes whenever you look at their crowd definition so people don't realize the ca had a very good crowd definition it's just what unless you ask for it wasn't that publicly put out but the crowd definition was um because obviously we've changed now so this is just historical this is not the current because we've changed the rules and um, the old crowd one when it was a thousand people or more it was defined as an open air um mass gathering essentially so what they defined that was is anywhere where the crowd are pre predominantly there for a single purpose i.e watching a concert i.e they're all watching the, the, the stage yes but also where their movement is constricted Yes. The reason they said that is because if your movement's constricted, i.e. you're in a, a large outdoor crowd and you can't move around that freely, your ability to get out of the way if a drone was coming towards you or a hazard or was falling is severely impacted. Whereas at the back of an arena or back of an event where there's less people around, they weren't defining that necessarily as the mass assembled crowd exactly. because you had the ability to go and get cover or move out of the way. Yes. And that's where it came from, is about people being able to get out of the way of a crash or an incident. Exactly. And that's where the endangerment thing uh, sort of kicks in as well, because the Article 241 is endangering anyone by the flight of a drone, or you can. there's also a separate one for endangering people with, you know, endangering an aircraft with, a, with another aircraft. Um, in terms of the endangerment people, the burden of proof for them to prove that is that you haven't taken all reasonable practical measures to plan that flight to make sure it's safe. Yes. That doesn't mean you have to get rid of the hazard or, or risks. 
it just means you have to mitigate them where possible because as everything in life, nothing is risk or hazard free. Exactly. So it means having a solid plan of how you're going to do it. So if you're going to fly over a building, before you do a flight over that, I mean, I'll say every individual building, you have to have a plan. But if, you, if you're going to fly over a, a series of terrace houses or roof, just have a look at it. Even Google Earth before and identify any high risk ones in terms of glass coverage and things yeah, like good that. Idea. Good idea and just have Earth. a plan of these are my emergency areas. These are mm. where I'm going to fly. I'm going to keep over the apex or I'm going to keep over the back or front. And that way, um, that way you have a plan. And if you have a plan and things go wrong, but the plan still was was in place and you can verify that, I don't think you'll get prosecuted under 241. Per se, I agree. I because agree. I think the burden of proof is that you had to, to an extent, be reckless and in danger. It, it, you are still going to be restricted to a certain extent, of course, because you have to watch out for people, and you have to watch out from the point of view of of, of the fifty meter horizontal. And that's another thing which has come up quite a lot with um, e uh, emails uh, to Geeksvana and and in the comments section, where people are also worried about flying their A two Legacy aircraft. One, because of the building thing, which, which now hopefully we've given an, an opinion that, that people can take or not. Um, but also they're concerned that obviously when they're flying over that second row of houses, they've still got full line of sight of their drone. But of course, they don't know if there's going to be someone walking down that next street. Um, so, you know, that, that that again causes an issue for them and, and cr creates a, a nervous flight when perhaps people were very excited about the A2 CFC initially. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things that you will get into the rhythm of doing these things as natural sort of you yes. know as a, a sort of motor uh, response, but the the key thing I would say is people are not going to be in that area for very long if they're walking through or whatever. You know, it's 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 not going to pro massively prohibit you having to not fly over them. Um, because you know, it's just it's, it's just planning your flights to make sure you can exactly. do it in, a, in, a, exactly. in the right time. And, 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 the right and, 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 and exactly, and, and and when you are planning your flight, look at the fact that you're not going to be flying along the footpath, you know, or or, or, yeah. or along the centre of the road. Although that might create a nicer vision from a, a, a cinematic effect, um, uh, it's much safer to keep them over the over, yeah. over the I mean, firm that, that, properties. That, you're, you're right in terms of. The problem is some people have an idea of a shot in their head. Yes. That does not mean you can do it. Indeed. <laughs> the, 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 that's the issue is A2 will not guarantee you can do every shot you want to get. Yes. Because that's why there's other categories that allow you more enhancements and like we can go down to five meters and things. Um, so that's the problem you've got is the is, is the yes. people in people's head they and, think that uh, would look really cool but don't, you can't, yeah. just, can't do it with an A2. Exactly. And that's the problem because you can do a lot with an A2 but you definitely can't do everything. Some of this is a hangover almost from the fact that obviously we're, we're being allowed this legacy period to fly our existing drones in. Because of course, when the new A2 drones come in, the C2 yeah. drones come in, we are going to be able to flick that tripod switch or, or that slow mode switch. And then we're yeah. going to be able to get within five meters of people. And now suddenly a flight in the town center in, in you know, the, the center of Guildford, um, a, a large town stroke city close to me, becomes an awful lot more manageable um, mm -hmm. um, fr from from a, from a risk point of view, because one, your, your your drone isn't going at any great speeds; it's not going to hurt anyone. Two, it's at a height where it's not creating any kind of privacy issues. Um, and three, you can get within five meters of those people. So I, I think as well, we do have that slight hangover stage, and um, you know it, it, that 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 will eradicate itself once the new drones start start to come out. I think the, th the final thing I would finish with as well is, is about people getting confident using the the A two conditions. Yes. So. I know it may feel like um, sort of a sort of mission of not knowing things or whatever to ask people for help to an extent sometimes, but I do think that it, it might be worth spending a little bit of money asking, for example, an RAE who you know were approved by the CA yes. to help you with just supervising or working or doing some flights with them to get confident because one of the things that gives people confidence on the GVC is the feedback from the flight test. Absolutely. So I, I think it's really important that's a big bit missing from the A2 in terms of it gives you the confidence that you know what you should do, but you're putting it into practice in the appropriate way. Because even if you are doing it right, you'll still have little niggles if no one's told you otherwise. Yes. You know, in your head saying, you know, I'm concerned that... Yeah. Is you, this because, the right way to do it? From, from, I, I from, from the theory into practice. My first PIFCO test. Uh, absolutely. You know? Absolutely. From from theory into practice is a completely different thing. And yeah. I, I, I know that from when I were, when I was a hobbyist with my with my little bebop in the background here. Okay, well, as I say, we have we have more videos on this coming up uh, very soon, including a live show with the uh, particular subject of how to plan your flights. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and we'll, we'll see you all very, very soon. Thanks for watching. It's over to Lib. What?
Well, you're hanging around. I thought I'd hang around with you. What are we waiting for? Hmm? Oh, that's it. Well, why are you still here then? It's like the blind leading the blind. 